The Algonquian language people once lived in small villages from present-day North Carolina up to Canada. Based upon the archaeological evidence, beginning about 10,000 B.C., these indigenous tribes occupied the northeast American coastline in the Great Lakes region. Perhaps the best-known Algonquian is Pocahontas, princess of the Powhatan tribe. She is often remembered for befriending English colonists in Jamestown, Virginia, and fostering a peaceful coexistence. A different Algonquian tribe, that is the Lenape, lived slightly northward. Sometimes called the Lenny Lenape, or Delaware Indians, the Lenape occupied areas that were to eventually become New Jersey, eastern Pennsylvania, northern Delaware, and Maryland, as well as southern New York. English explorers named the Delaware River in honor of Thomas West, Lord Delaware, and among English speakers that name stuck to the indigenous peoples living there. They, however, called themselves the Lenape. Lenape translates to meaning ordinary common people, although other historians have interpreted Lenape as meaning original people, that is, those from which all other East Coast Algonquian language people descend. For their persons, they are generally tall, straight, well-built, and of singular proportion. They tread strong and clever, and mostly walk with a lofty chin. They grease themselves with bear's fat clarified, and using no defense against the sun or weather. William Penn, 1683. Historians rely upon early eyewitness accounts, as well as Native American oral traditions, because the ancestors of the Lenape did not keep written records. And without known period names, archaeologists have applied the terms Paleo-Indian, Archaic, and Woodland to the Lenape timeline. Tools, pottery, and general cultural practices are used to define these distinctive errors. For example, this handcrafted Lenape pot is from the late woodland period and is at least 500 years old. Consisting of scattered diverse tribes, such as the Raritans, the Tappans, the Navasinks, and others, the Lenape occupied the region that would become New Jersey. Words like Hoboken, Hackensack, and Amboy all originated via European interpretations of Lenape names. Our Raritan River once separated two divisions of these Native Americans. Like any culture, slightly different dialects are spoken throughout the Algonquian language people. Muncie was the Lenape dialect north of the Raritan River and was spoken in what would become Perth Amboy, whereas the Uname Lenape dialect was used south of the Raritan. Despite this, all Algonquian language indigenous people would have been able to understand each other. Lenape homes were made from saplings, bent over to form a dome-shaped trellis, upon which tree bark was attached to provide a weatherproof cover. These dwellings were occupied by several families, with sleeping bunks and everyday essentials all located inside. Lenape culture is a matrilineal, as the inheritance and social order was traced through the female line, so all Lenape lodges belong to women. Their houses are mats or bark of trees set on poles, in the fashion of an English barn, but out of the power of the winds, for they are hardly higher than a man. They lodge in the woods about a great fire, with the mantle of duffels they wear by day wrapped round them, and a few boughs stuck round them. If a European comes to see them or calls for lodging at their house or wigwam, they give him the best place first. William Penn, 1683. European visitors were not only given lodging, but also the best cuts of Lenape food. Beans, corns, and squash, along with meats, were cooked in handmade clay pots. These pots were placed in an open fire pit. Meat or fish were also set over a makeshift grill, or placed on sticks and roasted over a wood fire. Fish, oysters, and clams were an important part of the Lenape and Algonquian diet. Pictured here, on the far left, is a 16th century fishing weir, constructed out of hundreds of tree branches and saplings. This arrangement redirects the path in which the fish swim, providing Algonquians an easier access. Multi-pronged wooden lances, harpoons, and nets were used to harvest the fish. Dugout canoes crafted out of tree trunks navigated the waterways. Manufacturing a Lenape canoe took a week's worth of labor. Usually a straight tulip tree was selected and cut down, although cedar, chestnut, or oak trees would also be used. The tree trunks were then placed on a rack. 
Hot coals from a fire would be put along the top, allowing the center to be carefully burnt out. These were so well made that a few Lenape canoes still survive and can be seen today in museums. Final work was done by hand carving out more wood to make a smooth and even interior for the canoe. The Lenape ate their meals twice a day, once in the morning and then again at night. Lenape meals typically included corn, beans, and squash from their fields. Called the Three Sisters, these crops would be grown together, as the corn stalks provided a sturdy structure for the beans to climb. The beans enriched the soil, and the squash vines covered the ground, keeping weeds away. All three could be boiled, roasted, and cooked with other vegetables, meat, or fish. Neither tables nor chairs were used by the Algonquian people. The Lenape sat on woven mats or animal skins placed on the ground. Thoroughly cooked food was removed from clay pots and placed in flat bowls made from wood. Sharp bone slivers were used to skewer hot meals. Meats included deer, elk, turkey, turtle, and bear, along with varieties of fish and Delaware River or Raritan Bay oysters. Note the worn concave surface in the middle of the Lenape milling stone. This rock was repurposed during 1684 as part of a Perth Amboy government building. Oyster shell mortar, made by a 17th century mason, is still attached to it. Milling stones were used to pulverize dried corn with the aid of a pesto rock. Examination of both sides show this rock is pitted with wear marks. Therefore, this pesto has seen use. Oddly enough, this rock was also repurposed as part of the same colonial foundation and found in context with the milling stone, and is also a perfect fit. Here, corn would be ground to grate the flour that made Lenape bread. These bone fragments were from a Lenape meal. All were found during an archaeological investigation in Perth Amboy. In the center is an antler that appears to have been worked or shaped. Antlers were used as tools. Taking place in a circle, ritual ceremonies were most important to the Lenape. Spirit faces appear on these wooden poles with the Creator God taking center place. Singing, chanting, and dancing were accompanied with handheld branches as well as rattles made from gourds and at times crafted from turtle shells. These Native Americans believed in one Creator God, with that God delegating authority to various lesser spirits such as the sun, the wind, the rain, and the earth. And praising these spirits was a way of life. In things relating to religion, they believe in God and immortality, for they say, There is a great king that made them, who dwells in a glorious country to the southward of them, and that the souls of the good shall go thither, where they shall live again. William Penn, 1683 Tobacco was also used in Lenape rituals. Both the tobacco and the smoking pipes are thought to be sacred. Tobacco smoke was used as an offering to the lesser spirits. At times, tobacco was burned as incense while calling to a spirit for help. The Lenape chiefs and their advisors typically smoked before making decisions. Smoking was engaged before going to war, making peace, or trading important goods. Wild tobacco leaves and blossoms were dried, and then two-thirds were mixed with one-third roasted sumac leaves. This combination was unique to the Lenape. Based solely on the smoke smell coming from this mixture, colonial settlers were promptly able to recognize the Lenape from other Algonquians. At the time of European entry, the Lenape were still basically in the Stone Age. These pieces were excavated during a Perth Amboy archaeological dig. The jasper and flint flakes exhibit evidence of Lenape craftsmanship. Taking many years to master, the skillful chipping of flint, along with other stone types, produced the needed tool. Pendants, drills, scrapers, knives, and projectile points were carved out of a single rock. Here is a Lenape arrowhead that was discovered within an archaeological test pit in Perth Amboy. It is only slightly larger than a penny. The style of this artifact is indicative of the late Woodland period, which began a thousand years ago. Prior to European settlement, Lenape hunting grounds extended across large tracts of land, such as the entire Middlesex County. Hunting devices were not only woodland period bows and arrows, but also snares, traps, and spears. Deer, along with other animals such as beavers, were not just food sources, but their hides were also used for clothing. 
Later, with the arrival of Europeans, beaver pelts, along with bear, otter, and deer skins, become a valued trade item. While the Lenape had used animal pelts for clothing, blankets, and pouches, white traders valued furs for profit. European settlers followed a way of life that was very different from the Algonquians. The Lenape believed the Creator God gave the plants, animals, and the earth for the use of all people. That is, the natural resources and the land itself could not be owned by any individual. In stark contrast, European colonists believed the land could be owned outright, with many Europeans traveling to the New Jersey colony in an effort to acquire their own property. The Woodland Period Lenape and their ancestors did physically leave their mark on the land. While these indigenous people did not have a written language, they did carve petroglyphs. Archaeologists believe this petroglyph was completed around a thousand years ago. Most petroglyphs are carved using harder rocks, that is, a stone, chisel, or hammer stone. At no more than three-eighths of an inch deep, petroglyphs can be difficult to see and are best perceived when the sun is at a low angle to the rock. And when viewed, these images are a direct window into the minds of early Native Americans. Petroglyphs were a form of symbolic communication. Historians believe petroglyphs convey an important message. However, we do not know what that message is. In theory, these might describe tribal boundaries, hunting grounds, or perhaps a sacred location. The Lenape were experts in carving stone and shell. Excavated at a Perth Amboy dig, two work rock pieces and a button were discovered together. The button was hand-carved out of a single clam shell. Perhaps this button was made by Native Americans for trade with Europeans, or conversely, traded by white settlers to the Perth Amboy Lenape. Archaeologists found fragments of a copper pot from an early Perth Amboy colonial site. This vessel was purposely cut up, as it was common to trade copper pieces to the Lenape. Highly prized among all Algonquians, copper was worn as a status symbol. And while trading was constant, all was not peaceful. During 1634, the Lenape fought the Susquehannock Indians, later warred with the Dutch, and then battled the Iroquois. In all these conflicts, the Lenape were defeated. And in addition to deaths from war, European diseases such as the measles, smallpox, cholera, and the flu also decimated the Lenape. Within only a few decades, the East and West Jersey Lenape population was reduced from around 20,000 to only 2,000. And by the time of East Jersey proprietor and Pennsylvania founder William Penn's arrival in 1682, the Lenape were only remnants of a once great tribe. According to legend, the Lenape presented William Penn with this wampum belt in 1682. This belt was a highly valued item. Clam and whelk shells were used to make this most valuable trade possession. Wampum is a European contraction of the Algonquian word for string shell beads. The making of this belt was time-consuming. Each small bead shown here was hand-carved. Rubbing on stone smoothed out the beads. After shaping, a hole was drilled into each of the clam beads. Finally, all were connected with deer hide and plant fiber. The purple beads originated from clams, while the lighter ones came from univalve whelks. Besides being used for adornment and trade, wampum was also employed in healing rituals. And more commonly, it was used in the same way Europeans exchanged money. While East Jersey and Pennsylvania proprietor William Penn was known for purchasing land from the Lenape, he was not the first to do so. In 1626, the Dutch purchased Manhattan Island. Three decades later, Augustine Herman purchased a large section of central New Jersey from Lenape Chief Matano and others. That land included what was to become Perth Amboy. Herman and Matano called the area where the Raritan River and the Arthur Kill meet on Pogi, which was later corrupted into the word Amboy. During 1638, colonists from Sweden acquired Lenape land along the Delaware River. These settlers named their territory New Sweden. Fortifications were built as a defense against Native American warriors. However, such forts were not needed. While almost every colony in North America had bloody conflicts with indigenous tribes, the Swedes did not. For the most part, the Swedish relations and trade with the Lenape remained peaceful. Eventually, less than 20 years later, New Sweden was taken over by force 
when Dutch soldiers arrived. In 1664, a much stronger military force displaced the Dutch. Four British warships sailed into Manhattan Harbor and took control of the Dutch territory. Numerous new land deals by means of signed treaties were completed between the Lenape and the English. When the purchase was agreed, great promises passed between us of kindness and good neighborhood, and that the Indians and English must live in love as long as the sun gives light. William Penn, 1683. Despite the good intentions of William Penn, others did not treat the Lenape fairly. By 1758, the Treaty of Easton was signed. That agreement required the Lenape to relinquish their New Jersey homeland, a place they had lived for over 10,000 years. Only one small reservation in Burlington County was set aside for these indigenous people. A few Lenape remained in various regions of New Jersey, with some retreating to remote areas and others marrying into European families. Today, descendants of Native Americans have formed three New Jersey-based tribal councils. Still, many others, the direct kin of those forced away, live in Oklahoma, Wisconsin, Kansas, and Ontario. All in all, let us remember, the Lenape were, and still remain, a part of our diverse culture, as well as our rich history.